How many times have you gone through a street light that had just turned red and you were sure you still had time to go through it, that there would be no cross traffic? Tricia Barker did just that. She went right through it when another car plowed into her. She died for two and a half minutes and came back with an extraordinary story about what she saw on the other side. The previous night, Tricia had a nightmare that told her something bad was going to happen. And as it turns out, it did. That morning, she skipped the coffee. Always a bad idea if you're a coffee drinker. And she got on the road, feeling tired. When the light just barely turned red, in a daze, she goes right through it when another car crashes into her at the cross-section at 60 miles an hour. Tricia is taken to the hospital in tremendous pain. The nurses refuse to give her pain medication until a neurosurgeon signs off on it because she has no medical insurance. She's a student at the University of Texas and she doesn't think health insurance was a priority. I get that. When you're young, you think you're invincible. I did the same thing when I was a student. I didn't have insurance for a full 10 years. I couldn't afford it. Of course, I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was that nothing serious had happened to me during those 10 years. Tricia, not so lucky. Her back is broken in several places and she's strapped to a board for 17 hours in pain the entire time. When a doctor comes in and promises to do the surgery the next day, Tricia already understands what a broken spine means, that she may never, ever walk again. When she is finally wheeled into the operation room, she is told she has a 17% chance of dying during surgery. But she doesn't even care about that. She's already made the decision that if she survives, but cannot walk, she'll just have to end her life. While the surgeon holds her hand and tries to reassure her, that's when things get really strange. Tricia never believed in anything happening after death. When you die, it's done. Yet, she suddenly finds herself outside of her body. And she can see the medical staff operating on her from the top. What's interesting is that her experience from that point on not only has the features that are typically reported in a near-death experience, or NDE, but is also consistent with precisely what you would expect if someone's consciousness was somehow completely freed from the brain. I cover a full list of exactly what these features are in another video that I link to at the end of this one. For example, Tricia describes her visual experience as very different. Generally speaking, all experiences of NDEs report this. Think about it. They're obviously not seeing with their eyes anymore. Eyes feed information to the brain. The brain now must interpret that information of what is being seen. If it is possible for Tricia to experience anything at all without eyes and a brain, she has more of a direct experience of what is happening around her and filtered by the brain's visual system. I wouldn't exactly call it seeing anymore. I just don't know what to call it. In line with this is that what she sees is not just what is in front of her, but everything in a 360-degree panorama. In other words, she can see everything all at once. That's impossible when you have eyeballs that will only allow for you to see what's right in front of you, and precisely what you would expect when freed from that constraint. Think of the brain as being more like an organ that filters reality, an idea that was first proposed by Aldous Huxley and is now regaining support. Remove the filter and consciousness is now able to experience reality no longer constrained by that filter. Is that what is happening at death? What Tricia feels at that moment is what others also describe. Complete peace, a sense of being completely at ease and comfortable without a worry in the world. The reason, as she reports, is that she finds herself completely in the moment where past or future has no relevance. Now, if you know Eckhart Tolle, 
Among others, he speaks about this. Eckhart woke one day out of a deep, lifelong depression when he realizes that all of his problems came from overthinking, and he somehow was able to detach from his thoughts permanently and has lived in bliss ever since. He now teaches how to live in the moment and is best known for his best-selling book, The Power of Now. Thinking has the tendency to be negative. And when you believe in your thoughts and identify with them, they'll bring you down. It has been estimated that over 80% of our thoughts are negative. When you have anywhere from a few thousand to several tens of thousands of thoughts in any given day, imagine how many times you're ruminating, self-criticizing, or catastrophizing. Most people are not even aware they're doing this. So now imagine that you could experience consciousness when the brain has effectively shut down. The brain cannot, at this point, produce thoughts, at least not in the sense that we understand. And your experience, as all gurus, mystics, and serious meditators have told us from time immemorial, would be one of utter peace and joy. Is this what is taking place in a near-death experience? With a brain that is offline, that is precisely what you would expect. Now buckle up, because things get stranger. Tricia now sees beings of light. This is very common in near-death experiences. Are they hallucinations? I cannot say one way or the other, but she refers to these beings as reassuring. They are channeling energy through the surgeons to help them save her. Remember that Tricia does not believe in life after death and she's certainly not religious. So this doesn't come from a place of bias. At this point, she makes a crucial observation, one that, as it turns out, was validated afterwards. She sees that the medical monitor flatlines. She is, by all accounts, dead. This doesn't bother her at all. She's having fun. So why not take some time to explore? She leaves the scene of the surgery, and as she passes from room to room of the hospital, literally going through the walls, she comes across and recognizes her stepfather. He is buying a candy bar from a vending machine. This is odd, because she always thought of him as being, in her own words, a health nut. He would, in fact, make fun of people eating candy bars. But he actually eats some of it, goes to another room, and offers her biological father and mother a candy bar as they are on their knees, praying for her. These details are important because it gives an opportunity to verify them later. So did this incident happen exactly the way Tricia tells us? That is a resounding yes. That was confirmed by her family, and there was no way that Tricia could have known this. Tricia now leaves the hospital altogether, taking in the city of Austin before witnessing what appears to be the universe itself. There's an important quality of this experience because I've heard this time and time again in NDEs. From her point of view, her experience is so real, so much more vivid than the one you and I experience while still alive. And this fits a very commonly reported nature of NDEs. Remember the theory that the brain acts as a filter. Reality experienced directly would feel more real if it happens to be dampened by the brain. Now for Tricia, like many others experiencing NDEs, in comparison to what she is currently witnessing, life feels like a theater in which we just play a role or a dream she has just woken up from. After this, she has the typical life review and sees her grandfather who had died in his 70s, just much younger and healthier. This now is where I have to take issue with Tricia's experience. I do believe in the continuation of consciousness after death, because I strongly believe that consciousness defined by the essence of who we are, or pure awareness, does not originate in the brain. I'm bound to eventually make a video on why that is, so let me know in the comments if that's of interest to you. But why am I reluctant to accept Tricia's report of seeing her grandfather? It's simple. Physical bodies look the way they do because we are uniquely adapted to life on Earth. 
there would be no need to recall that same physical form after death. Many experiences do in fact report meeting family members, but many also report light forms or even just a sense of presence around them. Not always people who look like they still have physical form. So the only way I can resolve this, at least in my mind, is that people who have near-death experiences either project the forms of people they know onto an existing phenomenon in the afterlife, or the phenomenon in the afterlife itself reveals itself as a form that is recognizable and acceptable to the dying individual. Either way, I wouldn't give too much importance as to what an entity beyond death looks like. That's just my personal belief. Make this what you will. And feel free to comment on it. I know I get some criticism from some of you, and that's okay. Now, eventually, Tricia actually meets with a greater presence. The ultimate presence, you could say. She refers to it as God, whom she experiences as a big ball of light. I do realize that the word God has definite religious connotations and a different meaning for different people. But it is also often used to refer to the ultimate reality, the essence or the source of all that is. Ultimately, something has to explain all of reality. And whether it is some independent presence, the universe itself, or universal consciousness, I think that the word God is entirely appropriate. After this extraordinary meaning, which changed her for the rest of her life, Tricia hits what she refers to as a wall, something she can't get past, a limit she is forbidden to cross. She is, she is told, to go back, back to her life, and she would become a teacher. Tricia immediately refuses. She didn't want to be a teacher before, and she certainly doesn't now. All she is interested in is being successful, maybe making a difference in the world, but especially making money. I don't think that went down very well. So this is what happens next. Up until now, Tricia felt that she was in a place outside of time, expanded, free, and happier than she has ever been before. In other words, blissful. But unfortunately, she cannot argue with that entity anymore because she quickly finds herself, very quickly, back in her physical body. Immediately, she feels confined and constrained. Most near-death experiences report that exact same thing. Returning to the body is not a pleasant experience. It feels like being back in a prison of pain, both mental and physical. And they hate it. After three days in the ICU and nine months in a body cast, Tricia slowly recovers. This experience has changed her significantly. She is more kind now, more in tune with nature, and more spiritual. Her outlook on life has completely changed. By the time she can walk, she goes back to school. She has a new goal in life, and she achieves it. Tricia becomes a teacher. If you've had a near-death experience and you would like to share it, I would love to interview you. So make sure to contact me on my website at psychologyofthestrange.com. I provide the link in the description below. Bye for now.